Carrington for Eye on Baltimore. So don't touch that dial. Eye on Baltimore has some good information for you. You're going to have a great time. Don't change that channel. We'll be right back. Baltimore Museum of Industry, a slice of life from Baltimore's past. Uh, I remember going to the Kester's Bakery. Uh, there was a branch right down on Lexington Street where you could go in and buy the cakes and cookies, a wonderful place. And then of course there's McCormick Spices. I remember riding the transit bus and smelling cinnamon the whole time I'm in the area of Pratt and Charles Street uh, it was, and Light Street. It was just a wonderful, wonderful aroma. And don't forget the adventure of Domino Sugar. That my father at one point in his life worked at the sugar house. That's what we call Domino Sugar. They would bring in the raw sugar on the barges and on the boats. They would park near the uh, harbor and they would transfer the raw ingredients to Domino Sugar and they would refine it into that confection that we all love. Sugar! <laughs> hey, let's take a look at this. Hey, I was a little hungry, so let's go to the bakery. Here we are. Food, my favorite thing. Baltimore's baking industry took off very well because people were coming from all over Eastern and Central Europe. And if they weren't interested in getting into the uh, making machines and, and working in a factory, they were always good at making food and putting food together. The bread industry is one of them, as well as cakes, pies, and cookies. The baking industry did very well also because not only did we have flour and milk um, here in Baltimore, but Baltimore was, is the home of the McCormick Spice Company. So when we talk about chocolate chip and cinnamon cookies, and when we talk about fruit cakes and cherry pies, we all got those spices from McCormick Company, which was located in the inner harbor of Baltimore. So there was lots of mills and lots of things going on downtown in Baltimore. And in fact, one of the nicest things about coming to the harbor was we were able to smell the cinnamon coming from McCormick's. As you can see, these huge ovens, they're convection ovens. They use less time in baking. If you've probably seen some of them if you've gone to one of your favorite pizza places. If you came into the baking industry, you would want to see our display case of various breads and cakes and pies and cookies. You'll see our fruit cakes and chocolate chip cookies, the coconut cake, the wonderful fruit pie. You'll see the tins that they are often used. One of the companies, the Kessler, uh, Kester's um, company, uh, it's a loaf of bread or loaves of bread that are right here that were made in Baltimore. Domino Sugar. Well, Domino Sugar is one of the big companies here in Baltimore City. In fact, it is one of the few companies that is still here on the harbor. The Domino Sugar Factory sign is a landmark here in Baltimore. And in fact, if you want to know a little known information about it, the Domino Sugar Factory, that lighting, the neon sign, is approximately one basketball size large, uh, court big. Imagine that. Oh, welcome back. You got an eye full. Well, guess what? We're going to fill the other eye. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more Eye on Baltimore. One of the most famous ships of that period was the Bonhomme Richard, which represented the last of an era with lanterns on the stern. As soon as the war had ended, Baltimoreans rushed to the piers to welcome the ships starting back in the flourishing world trade and to wish them bon voyage. Shortly after the adoption of the federal constitution, 
The shipping tonnage of Baltimore was 36,300 tons with nearly 8,000 licensed and enrolled vessels. Today, the Sparrows Point shipyard is building individual ships, one of which is almost equal to the entire tonnage of the 8,000. The first customs house was started in Baltimore to take care of the flourishing trade, and local merchants made shipments on their own vessels for their own account, establishing Baltimore Port as a local institution with a shipping business controlled strictly at home. Uh, inside the Baltimore Museum of Industry, there's a drugstore that's many, many, many years old. You'll have reminiscences of what your grandparents probably experienced when they went to the drugstore. Let's take a look at this. Another wonderful, beautiful uh, thing about Baltimore is some of the ingredients that are, um, we use to keep ourselves looking beautiful. We also like having beautiful teeth. Baltimore had the first dental college in 1840. But here we are in our pharmacy. Um, this pharmacy was at what you see in this room, if you can see anything in this room, is about 80% of what used to be in Dr. Dr. George Bunting's um, pharmacy that used to be at 6 West North Avenue. Here, Dr. Bunting is famous for this wonderful product that came out of a blue bottle. Um, there was a gentleman, allegedly, that came to Dr. Bunting many, many decades ago, and his wife suffered from eczema. Eczema is spelt E-C-Z-E-M-A. I'm sure many of you who have had it don't need to be reminded. However, Dr. Bunting was a pharmacist that knew some of the basic compounds for skin care. The gentleman came back. Dr. Bunting gave him this compound. He took it to his wife and it worked. And when the gentleman came back to Dr. Bunting, he said, Dr. Bunting, my wife, she has no eczema. No eczema, which is spelled N-O-X-E-M-A. And for you wonderful English and grammar spellers, we know that spells Noxema, the wonderful product invented right here in Baltimore. And it has now become the Noxel Corporation, and it's now an international company. Started right here in Baltimore. Another uh, product here in Baltimore, as I reach over, Broma Seltzer. Um, there used to be a wonderful landmark on the corner of, it still is a landmark on the corner of um, Utah and Lombard Street. Uh, Broma Seltzer was also a product that was invented by a sea captain to keep his wife happy. She had indigestion. And as you can see, Broma Seltzer has 12 letters in it. The Broma Seltzer clock tower has 12 letters in it, spelling out the time. A product came right out of Baltimore. And please note, it's in a blue glass jar as well, pretty much like the Noxzema. Baltimore has a rich history in blue glass also. The counter is for the seltzer water, the soda products. Uh, the pharmacist was a place where people had their social gatherings. Also, the pharmacy was where people, generally speaking, we take a lot of the wonderful conveniences that we have for granted, such as color televisions, telephones, radios. There was a time when uh, everyone didn't have a telephone. So the, at the pharmacist, the pharmacist had the neighborhood telephone. Uh, there was a gentleman that may have worked here, the soda jerk. Soda jerk, because they used to pull these knobs back. Um, he would also answer the phone and run to the actual address to say, there's a phone call, you have to come back down to the uh, pharmacist and answer your private call. There were um, party lines, so to speak. More people had party lines than individual lines. <laughs> Like that? <laughs> well, hey, how about going to a movie theater? Let's get some popcorn and visit a movie theater. All right. Uh, in this room, this is our um, movie room, and we have several pictures of uh, several large posters of movies. There were well over two dozen movies that were shot here in Baltimore: Serial Mom Killer, uh, The Tin Men, uh, Clara's Heart, um, and Ladder Forty Nine, um, Avalon, Liberty Heights, I believe. Uh, a couple of movies by Barry Levinson. 
Uh, so we have some photos and we also show a movie here in our movie room. Hey, did you know that Baltimore had a really wonderful garment industry? Well, people with sewing machines and working on fabric and creating the clothing that everybody in America wore. Well, we're going to take a look at some of that. Welcome to the Garment Gallery at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. Here, there is a lots of rich history about making clothes. Initially, the first clothing uh, factory in the United States was made for men. Men were sailors. Boats got around on sails. Uh, so the uniforms were made by a lot of people that worked at the garment factories here in Baltimore City because Baltimore also is one of the most western ports on the United States. But uniforms were being made for the sailors. Initially sailors uniforms were only a t-shirt and a slack. Then later on in the 1860s because Baltimore was a southern state but it was in the middle, we made here the uniforms for the northern the Union soldiers, as well as uniforms for the Confederate sailor, sail, uh, soldiers. All right, as you look around in our gallery, you'll see the bolts and bolts of fabric. You'll also see lots of threads here. Baltimore, again, was very important because in sending the cotton to the north from the south, it stopped here in Baltimore. And then when the fabric was made in the north, it was shipped towards the south. And again, Baltimore was one of the first places that a lot of fabric was made. Also, some of the wonderful things that happened and some of the awful things that happened in the garment industry is that women were the least paid workers. Women um, were, again, were not very skilled workers. Uh, they were at one time not allowed to go to school. They weren't very well trained. However, they were excellent sewers. So women did the sewing. The skilled job in the garment industry were men who had to do the cutting of the fabric as well as, believe it or not, men did the ironing. Yes, men do iron from time to time. So that was one of the very highly paid jobs in the garment industry. Another fascinating story about the garment industry is that there was a time when and there still is in some places, people only were paid by how much they produced. They didn't get paid by an hourly wage or a yearly wage or salary, so to speak. It was very commonly called piecework. Women would sew sleeves, collars, uh, you name it, and they were paid by how much they produced. And that was very popular in the garment industry as well as many other industries. You only got paid by how much you produced piecework. Unfortunately, women work 10 to 12 hours a day uh, in the garment industry. At a time, sometimes uh, they didn't even take their lunches. And the garment loft was one of the highest parts in the building. So when heat rises, as we all know, sometimes they would want to faint or they just felt tired. In the garment industry, there was a mattress where the women were allowed to take a nap. And obviously, yes, if they were taking a nap, they were not getting paid. And that, again, is one of the many reasons why they only were paid piecework. Lots and lots of women did the sewing. In the garment factories, many garment factories, there were at least anywhere between 30 to 60 women working at 10 hours a day, six days a week on any given day. Here in Baltimore, we have lots of garment factories, gar garment companies. London Fog is one of the old garment factories that was here in Baltimore. Um, there was also Sam Glass. Sam Glass was a good company here. Conditions in the garment factory and in many of the shops were not at all pleasant. In fact, women did not have it easy at all, and the women were a lot sturdier. For instance, here in Baltimore, we have what's called the wharf rat. In the garment factories, in many garment factories, mice, rats, ran rampant. This is the place where women started carrying the lunch pail. They brought their lunches, it may have been bread or sausage or coffee, they sat it right at their workstations. 
and they continued to work and they never had to worry about mice or rats getting into their food stuffs. Wow, wasn't that a, a slice of life? That's exactly how those young women had to work in the garment industry uh, back in the old days here in Baltimore. Uh, in fact, there was a terrible incident that occurred in New York. Uh, the poor ladies were locked into a room to sew and there was a fire. Well, uh, hopefully uh, that'll never happen again because we've uh, changed our laws and our rules of work. But uh, we're on Island Baltimore, and we'll be right back after this break. Tobacco, of course, was one of the principal exports from this area. To get it to the waterfront, slaves rolled it up and down the hills over the route now known as Rolling Road. Small craft like log canoes picked it up in the waterways now considered only a tiny branch of the Patapsco. More mills began springing up along the small tributaries and waterfronts, anywhere that the grain could easily be transported by horse or watercraft. Flour soon became one of the area's principal products. Welcome back. I own Baltimore. I'm John Carrington. Uh, we're at the Baltimore Museum of Industry, and there was a wonderful display. There is a wonderful display of communications techniques and equipment. Uh, telephone, telegraph, teletype, all typewriters, everything that you would ever want to know about the history of communications. And let's take a look at this. In our hallway, you may notice many pictures of printing. Here we are in the printing gallery. One of the first things that you'll notice is our wonderful acorn press on the left-hand side. Um, the acorn press dates back to 18, 18, approximately 1828. It's the uh, grandchild, or I should say the, yeah, the grandchild of Mr. Eli Gutenberg, who invented the first press in the 1500s. Printing is one of the fastest growing industries. It has changed from 1500 to now in 2000. We can do things so rapidly with the computer. However, when we travel back in time, in the 1800s and the 1700s, newspapers were only given on specific days or they were taking at least a week sometimes to get the newspaper together because news even though we say today news travels fast to print it took a longer time. The Gutenberg when he started the printing press he put letters on uh, made letters out of wooden blocks. In time we found out that that wood wore down so then we used, started using metal. have the linotype machine, which is the next major phase of the printing industry. After the acorn press, or hose press of the 1820s, we have Mr. Mergenthaler's linotype machine, again, which, which was patented in 1898 here in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, one of the highlights is, uh, now that we're in almost the 22nd century, is the uh, cellular company, uh, Cellular One which was the first independent cell phone company, was right here in Baltimore. That company now is called Singular, and now Singular is the new AT&T. Wow, what a great place the Baltimore Museum of Industry is. Uh, in fact, there are vehicles inside the building that Go back years and years ago, uh, the old SK meat wagons. Ah, yeah. How about the fire trucks that were pulled by a horse? <laughs> yeah. And how about the old taxi cabs? And examples of the electric cars of today, as well as some of the old vehicles from long ago. Let's take a look at this. transportation gallery you will see many vehicles that uh, that were created and were used anywhere between 1908 to 1980 behind me is one of uh, the old vehicles that are here as you may see it's the oil carrier here we are with Jacob Fusel's carriage Jacob Fusel is acclaimed to be the father of the ice cream industry uh, he used to be a dairyman after carrying the milk around for so long, uh, one of the interesting things happened was the milk would sour or the milk would change. Eventually, in 1851, he started the, the ice cream 
industry. Huge truck from the early 1920s. It is huge because it's made of wood, but it also is huge because it had to carry the dry ice to keep the meat fresh for its various deliveries. SK is a combination of two gentlemen's names. One is William Schlutelberg, and the other man's name was Thomas Kirtle. They took the S from Schlutelberg, the K from Kirtle, they put them together, SK, or and it is spelled out phonetically, E-S-S-K-A-Y. Speaking of Ma Bell, oh, I got a call. Oh, not really, CMP. Anyway, this is a CMP truck from the early 19, 1920s, between 1920 and 1930. Um, it was retired, but believe it or not, Chesapeake and Ohio's uh, company colors were gray. It was later on painted green. It only carried one person, the operator. Wow, look at this vehicle here. It's one of the, uh, I should say, the newest vehicles. It was the Spicer Production vehicle, how the Spicer Production, made here in Baltimore, a company that was really good in the early years in Baltimore, well, the early years in 1980, um, how they, the messengers used to carry information as well as film here in Baltimore. Uh, it's an electric vehicle, which made it a whole lot different. It was very efficient. And we are also very proud of the Spicer Company. This is a 1947 Ford truck. It's a one ton. Um, we've actually matched it to the original cream uh, colors from the early 1947s. There was a lot of art deco, so to speak. It's a, a great truck, and from time to time, it has appeared in uh, several Thanksgiving Day parades. Also behind me, you might notice the Crown Oil uh, pump. Crown Oil was a company that was very popular here in Baltimore in the very early 1900s. They still or were working on one of the uh, buildings that's on, ch one is on Charles Street and then there's another oil company uh, building on St. Paul Place. And also you may notice the wonderful insurance uh, sign. It's a great neon sign. Baltimore made very many great neon signs in the early 60s and 50s, and this is one of the few that you might see here at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. This is the Davidson Transfer. This is a early moving van. Um, initially, one of the Davidsons, he opened up his business on Utah Street. He used uh, about 10 feet on the curb of Utah. He actually advertised that they would move their people's housing and furniture to four major cities, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Baltimore, and New York. The company now is, as you may see, also it was on German Street. German Street later on has become Redwood Street here in Baltimore City. Hofburger industry has been around since 18, at least 1882. They used to carry coal and ice and various products, including wood. Now they just use uh, the Hofburg name for oil. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this part of the tour here at the Transportation Gallery. Oh, welcome back. And oh, the corner store. Uh, yes, it, it has changed. Back in the old days, there were screen doors with um, screen paintings of blue ribbon bread and other products that were favorites of people uh, long ago. Well, Baltimore has a wonderful display at the Baltimore Museum of in in Industry, and that display has a corner store from long ago. Let's take a look at it. The deli is part of the company store. The building actually was part of Mr. Platt's oyster cannery that was started here in the middle 1800s. When a worker worked for Mr. Platt, they were paid in tokens, and then they would use their tokens at the end of the day and come to the deli store. They could get meats and milk and uh, various food products, fresh foods, and obviously they could get canned goods here at the deli. Also at the deli, this is the place where the butcher would also cut up the meats in specific, uh, whether you wanted a center cut or you wanted the end cut, the meat was cut fresh at the deli. Was fascinating but guess what Baltimore was a hub for transportation and shipping that's right we were one of the closest ports to the ocean therefore they could load 
various products that need to go back and forth between the Midwest and the East Coast right in Baltimore's harbor. Baltimore, a wonderful place to travel from, travel to, and travel through. And they're good examples of the boats and the trains and the examples of what was used to transport goods and people. Let's take a look. has a display of the old appliances from long ago. The refrigerator that used a big block of ice, yeah. Toasters, the appliances that we have grown accustomed to seeing nowadays evolved from some of the appliances that are on display at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. Let's take a look at them. Museum has the wonderful utensils that made life so wonderful. Uh, silverware was made here in Baltimore, and of course there were plates and glasses and 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 al also the various trappings of making life comfortable: combs and brushes, umbrellas. Oh, well, we have a lot to see at the museum. Let's take a look at this. Oh, what are these umbrellas doing? here and what are those hats over there well there was a time when the straw hat or the panama hat which the gentleman preferred during the summer were made right here in baltimore people people would travel from the north anywhere from massachusetts from new york they would come to baltimore to get a panama hat and those hats would only last for one season so they would return year after year after year and the, what about the umbrellas and the parasols? Well, believe it or not, up until the middle 1960s, Baltimore was the umbrella capital of the world. Wow, what a day. Uh, the museum is filled with memories from the past and also cues as to what the future might bring us. Yeah, I know you want to visit the Baltimore Museum of Industry. Yeah, yeah you, you really want to visit. We'll do it. It's your chance to see a slice of Baltimore from way back when. And this is Eye on Baltimore. We're always trying to bring you what's going on in Baltimore. Well, keep your eye on Baltimore and visit us again. Bye-bye.